Romans chapter number 8, verse 35 through 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, listen closely. For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Now listen, growing up, that's the only part I ever heard. There's another line to this. And it says, in King James, is nay. In your vernacular, it's no. Are you listening? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. This is what your Bible says. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Amen? So what he's doing is he's pulling an old, an, an old Testament law or an Old Testament happening declaration because under that covenant, same word, different covenant, under that covenant, it was applied different, and he said, it is written, it said, that we are killed all the day long for years, but I'm telling you no. Amen? We're more than conquerors. Joshua 1, verse 9. Joshua 1, verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee wherever you go. My Lord, I'm done. Let's have an altar call. What else you want to hear? What else could you hear? Think about it for a minute. That's why I said you ought to carry this thing with you. You get a little bit discouraged, pull up Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with you wherever you go. I want to preach to you for a little while from the thought, the heart of a conqueror. Right, and what I want and what I should have, and you ought to give it to. Amen? Listen, I'm just telling you, I'm not trying to, I, I do this. I believe that we have, in every, every Sunday morning, we have people of all, all kinds of belief systems, but we have a lot of young people that sit in this auditorium. And I know that your mom and dad, I know that you, those that love you, at home are telling you the right things, but I also understand that when you get to school and some of these other places, you're not hearing what you ought to be. You ought to hear. So let me tell you this: the Bible says, "If you don't work, you don't eat." Are you listening? That's the way that works. Now you, you, you. you there ain't no such thing as free. Amen. And if. They talk somebody into paying your college off. When you finally get that job with that piece of paper you've been wanting, you're going to have to pay for somebody else's. Because there ain't no such thing as free. Amen? Listen to me closely. All right. Now, if we... Um, mm, let me talk about convenience for just a minute. I don't know anything that's a blessing in my life that happened out of convenience. I don't know a single thing in my life that's good that happened out of convenience. I have a great marriage. Ask my wife. Amen? She's, this has been the time, hon. Amen, brother. <laughs> Mic drop. But you can ask her this, because we'll both testify it wasn't out of convenience. It didn't happen easily. It always takes a lot of work. Amen? We are living now in a day where people really think, and it, um that somebody owes them something. That they ought to have, and, and I'm amazed because um, at, at how many people, it, it, 
really young people think they ought to have everything mom and dad's got already. Well, trust me, it didn't start there. Amen? It took a long time. Amen? Now, I think you're living in a world that you can probably get there quicker than we did because you've got access to a lot more and better things than we had. But it's still not free. Hang on. To have, how do I say this? To have a, to live a blessed life in the kingdom of God where you become a true conqueror, you're going to have to understand that most things are not going to be convenient for you. Stay with me. In fact, I will tell you, if they're worth very much, they're incredibly difficult. You're quiet. Amen. Hopefully you're soaking it in, not just ready to run. Now watch. After he says, I've commanded this, the first thing he tells you, he says, be strong. Now listen to this. The Hebrew word, and this is important because if you don't understand the transition of the language, you won't understand exactly what he's saying. When God commands in the Hebrew here, be strong, It is a word that literally means to seize, to fasten on to, to grab or reach for the opportunity. So he's telling, now listen, in the context of Joshua, he's talking about conquering territory. Amen? That's what he's talking about. In, 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 in the, what's, what's happened, without going through the whole thing, God literally chooses a man. That man raises up a nation. He said, I'm going to raise up a nation through your loins. He raises up a nation. That man was Abram, who he later called Abraham. He raises up a nation. That, that nation becomes the Israelites in your Bible or becomes the Jewish nation, and they are God's representatives on earth. That's what the Bible says. So after man's fall, Adam used to be God's representative. Adam used to talk to God in the cool of the evening. After Adam sinned against God, there was a period of time where there was a separation, and God stepped back in and said, listen, I'm going to raise up a nation unto myself, and they're going to be my representatives in the earth. Are you with me? That's why, listen to me, that's why anti-Semitism is demonic. Because God doesn't break his covenants. Are you listening? Well, that's Old Testament. I actually had a family member of mine who goes to a Christian church and he said, well, that's Old Co- that's old Testament. That doesn't mean anything. That's Old Testament. I said, I'm going to tell you something. If God will break his covenant with Israel, he'll break his covenant with you. Are you listening? Well, but they rebelled. Oh, yeah? Well, have you rebelled? If that's the criteria, we're all going to hell. Are you listening? It ain't about, listen, that's what grace is for. Amen? It's when you mess up. Amen? Now watch. So God has a nation. He, he has a representative. And in that nation, it is a prototype of what we would do in the New Testament in the spiritual realm. Are you with me? It was literally a pattern of how we would spiritually conquer once Jesus came and gave us the new covenant. What do you mean? Well, think about it. Every story in your Bible is about spirit conquering, conquering spiritually. They fought giants and conquered giants. Now you fight giants and conquer. Are you with me? Do you understand? They would take, they would fight against the enemy and take back territory that the enemy had taken away. By the way, that's a message I could preach on for the next hour. I'm telling you, we live in a nation, church, where the enemy is trying to steal from us and has taken stuff away from us right out from under our noses. But God has commanded for you not to be afraid. He said, be strong. See grasp, claw it back, pull back what the enemy stole. Remember that old song you say, he's under my feet. Take back what the devil stole from me. It's about time God's people quit sitting back and whining about everything and started standing up and telling the devil, you don't get to take what I got. You don't get to take what God promised me. You can't have my kids. You can't have my marriage. You can't have my money. And you can't have my nation. You don't get to take away from me what God said I could have. Well, you know, brother, you know how it's all going to end. I hear it all the time from Christians. 
It's got to get bad before Jesus comes back. Well, I hope it gets bad on the devil because I ain't planning to participate. Are you listening? I mean, the reality is, church, we are called, regardless of the economy, to thrive. Are you thinking? We are called to take territory, to be a conqueror, regardless of the environment that the enemy places around you. Listen, from the beginning, he has consistently manipulated what's around believers, constantly. He's done that. You think about all the, from the beginning of time, he did it with Adam and Eve in the garden, has been doing it ever since to manipulate circumstances, manipulate what's around to try to get them to back up from what God gave them. Now watch. Oh, uh, mm-hmm. Let me, let me just put it this way. Without real convictions, you're going to be subject to whatever the enemy tells you your life's supposed to be. Say that again. Without true convictions, you're going to be subject to whatever the devil tells you your life is going to be. We have international denominations now changing the way they read the Bible because society told them they should. They have lost the convictions that we've had for thousands of years, the understanding of the Word of God that we've had for thousands of years, all because there's so much pressure to accept lifestyles that are not biblical. And because so much of the church world don't have real convictions. Oh, we'll sing and shout when we want to, but when it comes right down to living right, we can't seem to. Now listen, I'm, I, you know me. I don't preach legalism. I don't, I don't think everybody's supposed to or can be perfect. I don't think that. I understand that we all make mistakes. But listen, son, some of you ain't even trying. It reminds me of a story. You knew it would, right? This is one from Brother Randy. You'll like this. It has nothing to do with my message, but it's funny. He was in New York in Versace, actually, at the Versace. It, yeah, can you believe Randy would go in Versace? I, I can. And he said, he's, he's look, he said, I was kneeled down looking at, I think, a pair of shoes, and he said, these like size 12 red pumps walked up beside him. He said, I could see hair all over his leg. And he said, I stood up and it's this dude with a beard and a mustache and a red dress and red pumps. And he said, I said, you ain't even trying. <laughs> Sometimes I think Christians are like that. We got our bumper sticker. Amen. Follow us to wherever. And every time we get in trouble, we call the prayer chain and praise Jesus. And then we just live like hell whenever we want to. Are you listening? That isn't the way that it works. And if you're wondering why your life is just in turmoil like it is, that's why. I'm not talking about young Christians or people who just get saved and they're trying to figure out the Holy Spirit gets stuff out of us. But I'm, I'm amazed at how many Christians, been Christians 25 years, can't, Quit gossiping. Always just be quiet, Pastor. Let's move on. Here we go. Point two.
Watch. Be courageous. I'm going to tell you that this is, and I'm, I'm trying to move on, but I'm going to tell you that being courageous is the same thing as having, is not being afraid. It's just like not being dismayed. It's up to you. You have to be brave whether you like it or not. Now listen, if I had some holy oil and we could just bring you up here and I go, courage, I'd give it to you. Oh, we need to finish the rock. I'd sell it to you. Are you offended yet? No. But I don't have any of that. Now, there are times, thank God, where the supernatural part of God takes over and will impart things to us that we don't have. Amen? But when it comes to courage, when it comes to, and we'll get to be, be not dismayed, when it comes to these things here, God said, I commanded you to do them. I told you to do them. I told you to be courageous. Now, listen, you've heard this story, and I won't, I won't, so I won't go into the whole detail, but I can tell you, when I was, when I first felt God start calling me into ministry, I was terrified of talking in front of people. Now, one-on-one, I could, that wasn't any problem. I, I, was, I was a leader in high school. I could do that. That wasn't an issue. Uh, even a couple, two or three people, I could do that. But when it came to what you would call public speaking, you know, 10 or more people sitting like you're sitting, trying to talk, to, I, I'd freeze up. I couldn't do it. I just, I mean, yeah, you wouldn't know it now, but that's, that's true. Now watch. I also knew I was called to sing, to do music, and that was the first thing God, first opportunity, the first door God opened for me. And I, okay, can you give me a microphone and let me sit in the back row? Because I, and I remember back then, my aunt played the piano where we were at, and so I'd get over and get behind the piano. Stacy, you remember this. I go over. It's just a few years ago. Don't look at it. It's like we're old. <laughs> I get over behind the piano, behind Aunt Wanda, and hide behind it back, back there in the back. We had cords on the microphones back then, so it was okay. I didn't have ex- I had an excuse not to run. And so I, I, did, so I didn't even want to sing in front. I can remember growing up, I had two songs I sang in church, and Mom always made me sing them. She's right there. I was so nervous. Every time I said, I would shake. My legs would shake. I would. I hated it. And then they'd say, "Good job, son. Good job." And I couldn't even. I was. It was just a. It was just a blind spot. I didn't even know what happened. I was terrified. I went to college. You've heard me say this. I failed my public speaking because I couldn't do a five-minute dissertation in front of about twenty students. Not only I was so afraid of it, I didn't even show up. I just got a zero. I didn't go. And God called me to preach. Well, ain't he got a sense of humor? Well, what are you going to do now? You going to talk God out of something? See, see, a lot of us do, or we think we do. That's why our lives don't go the way they ought to. But when God has decided something for you, it is now your job to get it done. Are you listening? So I prayed, and I I can remember, and I told this story. I won't go through the whole deal, but I can remember the first time God told me, get out from behind the piano with the microphone. Nope, I'm not going to do that. I was miserable, miserable, miserable. Finally, one day, one night, actually, I did and the place just broke out. It was like pandemonium. People started shouting and jumping and dancing just because I took a microphone and walked around the piano singing a song. I can remember to this day what that song was. I never shall forget the day. <laughs> no, that's the song. I never shall forget the day. 
Amen. When all the burdens of my sins are rolled away, made me happy, glad, and free, I'll sing and shout it for he's everything to me. Amen. Well, that changed that part. Now I could get out, I could sing because I could, you know, memorize the words so you're not really getting tripped up on that. And then he asked me to preach. Well, I wasn't any good at that. I didn't like it. And so I would just stand and talk. The youth group, I could relate to them. So we had a, we had a, a, a great success in youth. I could relate to them. But God called me to preach. Now, listen, I'm not trying to, I mean, there's, the Bible makes a distinction between teaching and preaching. If you look up preach in the Word of God, it says to proclaim with a loud voice. It means to passionately deliver something. Are you listening? That's different than teaching. Teaching is also a calling of God. You listen. I have gotten just as much out of teachers as I have out of preachers and vice versa. Amen? Because it's the anointing that matters. But when you're called to do something, you got to do it. My preference would have been, God, I'm not doing it that way. (laughs) Most of us just say, no, it's not the way I like it. But you will never reach the place of blessing you need to be until you get out of your comfort zone and start doing something that God told you you could do and you're convinced you can't. Amen? Listen, if you don't stretch yourself, you're going to be stuck right where you are. And God is trying. He's not trying to be cruel to you. He's trying to get you to go to this place in him that completely fulfills you. Can I tell you this, that in ministry, there's nothing that I, that I have, um, how do I say this? There's no, there's no benchmark at this point in my life that I haven't reached that God called me to. So that gives you a satisfaction level. Now, I'm not telling you I don't want to be a better preacher or I don't want to preach in other places, anything like that. There's all kinds of ministry left to do. I'm just telling you that God will, if you'll just obey him, he'll just take you from glory to glory to glory to glory and show you all the things he promised you. It's when you do things out of your own preference and convenience is when you're going to end up in trouble. All right. I got to go. I got to hurry. It's 12:17. I got to it's like boiling a frog. You got to ease them back into it. <laughs> no fear. I'm going to read you. I'm going to read you a passage of scripture that I have never used on fear before, and I want you to think about it for a minute. This is in Deuteronomy chapter number twenty, verse eight. I promise you, I'm getting to the end. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, "What man is there that is fearful, fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his home." lest his brethren's heart faint well as his heart. You say that in today's vernacular. And the officer said, who do you have? What soldiers do you have? What people do you have who are fearful and faint-hearted? Tell them to go home. I don't want them rubbing off on these guys. Church, you've got to be careful about who you surround yourself with. You better listen to me. I have thousands of people that I would call friends, people who I like, and at least to my face, they like me. You know how that goes, right? But I only have a handful I let speak, speak into my life. Because I know who I am, I know what God's called me to, I know where I'm going, and nobody's opinion but God's matters. And the, are you listening? And, and that's not being arrogant because here's what will happen. God will put people into your life who see that same thing in you, and they'll speak to that. I'm not talking about, you know, never, allow, listen, I'm fine with somebody saying, hey, 
would this would this help you? Could this do better? Whatever. I don't, I'm, I'm not against correction. I'm telling you that you got to be careful because if you got somebody speaking doubt and unbelief into your life, it will drag you right straight down with it. This is biblical proof. They were about to go fight a, a war. And what, they, what, the, what the officer said was, if any of y'all think we can't win this thing, get to the house. I don't want you rubbing off. Amen? I can tell you in leadership in this house, in this church over the years, especially with board members, for the all, all I would, 99% of them have always been on board with the vision. They have constantly been a voice of, of reason, yes, but a voice of encouragement. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's conquer this. The reason you see sitting around you what is around you is because there have been men and women of God who have consistently said, we can do this, amen? We can conquer this. We can make this happen. All we have to do is step out in faith. Amen? Don't surround yourself with people to say different. I'm, I'm closing right here. Be not dismayed. This is a simple, I like this. Somebody asked Thomas Edison one time, because I don't know if you know the story behind the light bulb, but Thomas Edison said that the light bulb that he tried, the first light bulb failed a thousand times. Did you know that? It would just burn up a thousand times. Come on, be honest. On about number 30, you'd just be done. Right? It's a good thing we invented the light bulb way back then because we ain't got anybody to stick to that now. It ain't convenient enough. We'd just be all walking around in the dark. Somebody shout. Amen? This is what we used to teach people. It's how we used to raise them. All things are possible with some effort. Amen? So a reporter interviewed Thomas Edison one time, and he said, they said, what was it like to know that the light bulb failed a thousand times? And he said, the light bulb didn't fail a thousand times. The light bulb had a thousand steps. The difference, be not dismayed. Listen, what we usually do, we're affected by what it looks like the outcome's going to be. To be dismayed means confused, means not unsure. I'm not sure of what's going to happen here. We'll be sure of this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Be sure of that. Understand, church, that God said, be strong and of good courage and courageous. Amen? Don't walk in fear. Don't be dismayed. Forget what it looks like. Amen? And just walk in faith.